Good morning, everybody. First of all, it's thank you for allowing us uh, to be here uh, this morning. When uh, I spoke with Pastor Jonathan about why uh, uh, why he was going away, I assumed it was on vacation, and he said, "No, I'm going to preach at another church." I'm just wondering if this morning is like Pastor Swapping Day or something like that. We're all preaching in different locations, um, but uh, we're really glad to be here. I um. So this morning, uh, where's John at? So John, back here in the back, we got in. He was kind of telling me a little bit about it. you guys. He said, yeah, we kind of go, uh, we start, uh, officially start at 10.30. We usually don't get going, though, until about 10.34-ish. And so I said, all right, well, my sermon will only last about an hour-ish. Is that okay with you? Yeah. <laughs> no, just kidding. I won't take you that far. But um, it really is going to be here. I um. This is sweet to me because uh, I was a uh, senior pastor for nine years, and uh, you look like my church. Um, we, we were transient uh, over the course of nine years. I don't remember how many different locations we settled in before we finally found a place that we thought was home. And then when, uh, when the uh, cost kept going up, we found ourselves in another situation that put us uh, in a shared school building and uh, at that point a lot of my congregation were just tired of moving and uh, many of them went on to bigger churches and so uh, um, I've got to just say huge shout out to you guys not only uh, have you survived some of those obstacles because I remember where you guys used to be at over on Route 1 and now you're here but you also survived COVID so that says a lot about this church and God's uh, the work God is doing here. So, um, congratulations, guys. Uh, coming in, I um, you know just wanted to get to know you guys a little bit better through the website. Saw that back in May you had serve uh, Saturday, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. And uh, man, talk about the Great Commission. That's what it's all about. Amen. Amen. This is, it's it's not about the four walls. Yeah. Um, this is where we meet. This is where we get filled up. This is where yeah. God meets us together, right? But it's out there. Yeah. That's that's the commission. Yeah. It's to go and, and reach the, the lost. And that's that's my heartbeat. Um, so when I saw you guys out there and, and uh, the video that you did, I was like, this is the church I already fall in love with. So, um, anyway, my wife, uh, Kelly, is with me and my son, Sam. Uh, we have been married for about 18 years. We absolutely love the worship, by the way, this morning. Great is thy faithfulness was at our wedding. And uh, so if you were sitting behind us and you saw her grab my hand, that's why. Because it meant a lot to us. That was a, such an important song. Um, for us in our marriage, and uh, even to this day, uh, plays such an important part of uh, how God has worked His uh, His stuff out in our lives and in our marriage. So, anyway, we are really glad to be here. I'm a part of Riverside Church. I'm actually the youth pastor, associate pastor over there. And and uh, when Jonathan reached out a few weeks ago and said, "Hey, I've got this thing going on. Would you be willing to come and share?" Uh, it was it was my joy uh, to come and be here with you guys this morning. So. Uh, he told me that you are in a series called Hopefully, and uh, so we're going to continue that series this morning uh, on the story of Joseph. Uh, I want to begin by asking, how many of you guys would say that your life has gone exactly as planned? Yes. Come on. Come on. We got one. That's awesome. Um, how many of you had a Christian lie to you and said that if you come to Jesus, everything will be great from there on out? Some of you did? Oh my goodness, my life got hairy, thank you, sir. My life got hairy after I came to the cross. I'm telling you, man, it didn't go anything like I thought it was supposed to. You know, you, you come to the cross, you invite Jesus in, you're like, man, this, is, this feels good, you know. And then next thing you know, you're facing your first uh, battle, and you're like, well, Jesus, what? I thought if I followed you, I'd, like everything would be worked out here. And we know that that is oftentimes the proving ground of our faith is when we're going through those trials, right? Yeah, yeah. I think that's the place where God shows up and reveals himself uh, to us in a really sweet, sweet way. Um, I don't did that image that I sent him, did that get translated over? We have that. Um, how many of you guys recognize this image here? Have you seen this one before, right? It's um, my plan. I think we were all, we're all in that top yeah. scene, right? That, my plan is up there. Of course, God's plan takes us a little bit different route than what we probably uh, would have liked. But 
I would imagine that it resembles that bottom seam uh, that resembles what it's like for most of us. You know that there are these these trials, these valleys, and these floods and these uh, mountains to climb. Sometimes that we're just saying, God, where are you in the middle of all this? And God is just encouraging us to, to stay the course, right? To stay the course, to not give up. Um, hope is not an emotional feeling. Yeah. Is that right? All right, hope is not an emotional feeling. Hope is an anchor. Yeah. Hope is what hope grounds us to the cross. Yeah. Hope, is, hope is what grounds us to our faith. It's not a hope in something that is just uh, somewhere out there in the stratosphere, and we're, we're hoping that that thing that we call God exists. Hope is that uh, understanding, that assurance of our faith, that God exists, that he is for us and not against us, and that while we are walking through the trials that we face on earth, he is preparing a place for us, and someday we're going to get to see what that place looks like. Amen? Yeah. And that's going to be cool. That's going to be cool. And that takes all the trials that we face in this world, uh, all the, the things that we wish uh, were a little bit different, and, um, and just brings it down to this one thing for me anyway, and this is it, that God cannot, does not, and will not ever fail. Yeah, well, he doesn't. Fun. He'll never fail you. You may walk through hardship. You may, well, you may go through some of those valleys and some of those places and call out to God, say, God, where are you? That's normal. That's natural. That's humanity, right? That's the flesh. That's that we've all been in that place. Um, but I want to take you to a, a very familiar character in the uh, Old Testament, the story of Joseph, uh, one that uh, if you've been in the church for any period of time, you're at least familiar with the name. Um, I'm going to try to take uh, 22 years of his story and break it down to the next 20 to 25 minutes. So we'll see how well we do with this. Um, but the reality is that Joseph uh, exemplifies a guy who had a dream, and it did not go the way that he had hoped it would go, and uh, he stayed the course, and at the end of the story, we see the, the fulfillment yeah. of the dream take place in his life. And so, I've got three points uh, this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, by the way, if you have your Bibles with you, there's going to come a point I'm going to ask for three people to read a passage of Scripture, Okay. They're all out of this story, uh, but uh, there will come a point where we do that. Uh, so, but my, my first point is the punk with a dream. The punk. So, a lot of times, like right now, I have friends that are over at Riverside Dinner Theater watching Joseph and the Coat of Many Colors or Technicolor Dream Coat or whatever it's called. They're over there today. Pretty cool, right? Listen, man, Joseph was a punk. He was, he was not this guy that just had a dream. This was a an arrogant young man. Um, and there's a reason for that. We're going to look at that in just a second. But if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 37. And I'm going to pick it up in verse 2. We're going to read 2 through 11. Uh, there's going to be a lot of scripture, but I'm going to try to, to hone it down to help make it a little bit easier for us to walk through this. But uh, this first passage gets, helps us to get to know him a little bit. So and I'm reading out of the NIV. Uh, Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons, because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I have. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? So they're, under, they're interpreting this dream that Joseph is saying, I don't care if I'm the youngest, someday you guys are all going to bow down to me. Well, that's countercultural yeah. in his day, right? So, um, verse 9, then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers, and he said, listen, I had another dream, and this time the sun and the moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. And he guesses who those people were, mom, dad, and the same 11 brothers. <laughs> well, now it gets a little hairier here. So, verse 10, when he told his father as well, uh, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him 
and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter at mind. We have anybody here this morning that when you were a teenager, God gave you like a really, really vivid dream about what he was going to do in your life? Not me. So I'm glad I'm in good company, right? I had no idea at 17 years old what my life was going to look like, nevertheless, to get a, a dream from the Lord. Um, but let me ask this question, because I... You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. Was anybody in here the favorite child? Ah, uh -huh, because you're the only child. <laughs> you got it all. <laughs> There's something about the favorite child, guys, that, man, they get away with everything, right? They can do what they want. They can say what they want. They can act how they want. And somehow they always are able to go back to mom and dad, butter them up, and get away with stuff that nobody else in the family could get away with. And um, Joseph was that guy. So why do I call him a punk? Well, verses 2 and verses 4 tell us. Verse 2 says, Joseph went back to his dad and brought his father a bad report about his brothers. He was a tattletale. Because he could get away with it. Who gave him permission to be a tattletale? His parents. Because he was the favorite. And then verse 3 and 4 uh, it goes on a little bit more, um, and it says that his dad made a, a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him. And this is going to play out throughout the rest of the story. They hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. So, so I'm setting the groundwork for the rest of the story because you have to understand, uh, Joseph's brothers like literally hated him, right? We teach our kids, you're never allowed to say the word hate. Mm -hmm. Well, that's in the Bible. Uh, his brothers hated him mm -hmm. with a passion, so much so that before this dream comes true, uh, things are going to unwind. So there's two, two dreams that Joseph has. The first one is the dream where his brothers will bow down. The second one is where uh, his mom and dad and his brothers are all going to bow down to him. Man, what arrogance. What arrogance. Who is he to say that you will bow down? To me someday. Who is Joseph besides a 17-year-old tattletale punk brat? Well, maybe it's not arrogance. Maybe God was speaking to him. I just want to encourage you this morning when, listen, I, there's a lot of fluff out there, and I don't know how to discern some of that stuff that's out there because I don't know the people, but there are times where the Holy Spirit is speaking to somebody and gives them a dream and and God wants us to come around that and help that dream to come to pass. Amen? Like, yeah. that's, that's our calling is yeah. to help bring other people up. And, yeah. and in this case, uh, rather than that happening, his brother has become so incensed by the fact that God has given him this dream that uh, rather than coming alongside him, they, they, they take it another direction. So our second point is Joseph, the four-time prisoner. Mm -hmm. uh, if you know the story, we... We see the story where he goes to prison, but did you know he actually becomes a prisoner three times before he goes to prison? So there's a lot here to unpack in verses 12 through 35. So let me just kind of summarize what's going on. Joseph's brothers are all tending to the sheep. They're out in the pasture. They've gone to a, a town called Shechem. Uh, apparently the, the town has kind of started running dry on food for the animals. And um, so they go beyond that. But back in the day, they didn't have cell phones. They, you know, uh, Joseph's dad couldn't call up and say, uh, hey, Reuben, where are you guys at, man? Are you doing all right? You know, uh, the only way you could find out is you had to send somebody out after him. And so, uh, so uh, his dad says, hey, Joseph, I need you to go check on him. Joseph goes to check him, which is a ways away, and he arrives there, and, and his brothers aren't there. And so uh, they're asking, you know, he's asking, him, anybody see my brothers? Anybody see my brothers? Finally, somebody says, oh, yeah, um, things dried up here, so they went out to Dothan. Now, what is important about this for us? Why does that matter to us? I, I believe it matters for one reason, one reason alone. The enemy, this is my personal opinion, maybe Pastor Jonathan would have something different. My, my position on isolation is that the enemy will come after us and try to isolate us from the rest of our brothers and sisters in Christ 
in order yeah. to be able to get into our head yeah. and into our heart. Yeah. I don't think there's any, um, listen, I, when I read this passage of scripture, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that they could have been a check, right? They could have been there with their sheep. I think the enemy already knew that there was hatred in their hearts and so moved them farther away mm -hmm. so that when Joseph had to go find them, he was no longer in a town of people that would know the family by name. He was much farther. He was isolated. He was separated, mm -hmm. and it made him very, very vulnerable um, to what was going to happen. So um, Joseph gets there. He says, hey, Dad, wanted me to check on you, how you guys doing? But listen to what it says, Je uh, Genesis 37 and verse 18. Genesis 37, 18. His, but they, that's his brothers, they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill them. Like this hatred now is taking another level, right? This, yeah. this hatred for their brother has, has now crossed over another line. And, and um, I don't know about you, but may, maybe you have found yourself in a situation where uh, you got pulled away from the pack, right? You got separated from brothers and sisters in Christ. You got put in a position where um, you, your, your faith was compromised because you didn't surround yourself. I, yeah. I can't tell you, in 31 years of ministry, how many on fire bible believing testifying Christians I have been around that have fallen away from God. And I'll tell you exactly how it happened with every one of them. They stopped going to church. Yep. Yep. They stopped fellowshipping with brothers and sisters in Christ. And most, if not all, and I can't put my finger on every single one of them, but the majority of those people that I know that at one time had a fire and a zeal for Jesus Christ that stopped fellowshipping with brothers and sisters all fell away. Mm -hmm. Everything else become a, became a priority. Yeah. And so here we have his brothers plotting to kill him. And um, I would imagine that this attack was a long time in coming. This relationship had not been good for a long time. Mm -hmm. Joseph knew his brothers hated him. Right? You, you know when somebody doesn't like you. It's, 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 not, hard. it's, it's, uh, it's not hard to hide it? No. It's not hard to figure out. If people don't like you, it's not hard to figure that out. Yeah. He knew his brothers did not like him. And um, they had been plotting. Not maybe planning for a long time, but yeah. plotting yeah. for a long time because yeah. they hated him so much. This happened to be that moment when he was so isolated from everybody else and everything else that they knew this was their opportunity to go and attack him. You know, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The thing is about the devil is his tricks are no different today than they have been for the last six or seven thousand years. Since the time of creation, he has had the same tactics, but the, the way that he attacks us can be a little bit different. I believe this was something that was going on for some time in their hearts. I'm sure that they sat around campfires while their sheep were out grazing, trying to figure out what are we going to do about dad's favorite kid. So, the first prison that Joseph finds him in is in verse 28. When the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver. Mm -hmm. He is now a slave. His life is not his own. He has been bought for 20 shekels. Mm -hmm. 20 shekels. Mm -hmm. We have no idea what that really looks like in today's uh, value, but um, it's believed that uh, if it was a piece of silver, it would be worth about a dollar in today's economy, so about 20 bucks. If it was a gold shekel, it would have been worth about $5 per shekel, so about 100 bucks. Either way, what we get out of this is they weren't selling them for the money. Yeah. They were selling them to get rid of them. Hmm. They were tired of this mom and dad's favorite son being around them. So. We're going to jump over now to chapter 39 and verse 1 and pick this back up again. So the Ishmaelites have now purchased Joseph for 20 shekels, maybe 20 bucks, maybe 100 bucks in today's economy. Anyway, that's the value for a life for Joseph. 39.1. 
Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites and had taken him there. Now he's in his second prison. First the Ishmaelites, first prison. He's no longer his own. Now he's in the second prison. Um, and he has been purchased by Potiphar. Joseph is no longer the favorite son. He is the lowest man on the totem pole. That beautiful garment that his dad had once made for him no longer belongs to him. From this point forward, he will be scrubbing floors, washing dishes, and anything else Potiphar wanted him to do. And he wouldn't get away with anything like he was used to. So then we go down to the third prison, and that is the accusation of adultery. In verses, chapter 39, verses 6 through 16, we see this interaction. We find that Joseph, uh, in the passage of Scripture, is absolutely a hunk of hunk of man, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, he's a good-looking guy. He is handsome. He is, he is, like, attractive. And they, the Potiphar's wife is like, man, I want this guy for myself. And whenever Potiphar would go out of town on, a, on business, she would pursue Joseph. And, over the course of time, Joseph would keep pulling away and pulling away and saying, you know that's not right. She would continue pursuing him. And then in this passage of scripture, uh, in 39, um, 11, it says, one day he went into the house to attend to his duty, so he was scrubbing floors and washing the dishes and whatever else. And it says, none of the other household servants were inside. Remember about isolation? Putting yourself in a position where you can become vulnerable. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. At that moment, he was probably feeling like, Okay, I escaped it again. But she would take that cloak, and when her husband came back from his business trip, she would hold it up before him and said, Your servant tried to rape me. The third prison. He was innocent the whole time. And yet... He found himself in this place. And I wonder, as I kind of pause here and relate this story to us, I wonder if any one of us by this point in our story would give up on God. Maybe give up on the dream, right? Give up on, on the belief that really God really does care about me. Maybe maybe you got maybe maybe you would have given up before Potiphar's wife approached him. Maybe you would have given up when you were thrown into the cistern or when you were sold into slavery or when you were sold to Potiphar. I don't know what that place looks like for us. But I just want to encourage you, don't give up on God. Don't give up on God. Listen, when God gives you a dream for your life, and I believe he does, I believe that God has a plan for every life, mm -hmm. right? Every life has purpose. Um, I think the enemy is really, really good at snatching away the purpose sometimes. Yeah. When we let our guard down, we take, we, we, fail to put on that full armor. Maybe there's some of you, I don't know, again, who's here, but maybe you you found yourself in that prison yourself, right? That that prison of the first, second, or third ones, where you're just like, I have been bound for all this time, and today, might be today the, is the day that God is saying, but that dream I gave you, or that plan I had for you, it's all a part of your story, and I want to bring it to fruition. I want you to know that I haven't given up on you. I want that hope that you've had in me in the past to be resurrected in your life again. And now we have the fourth prison sentence, and that's in chapter 39. We're going to read this in verses 17 through 20. So uh, Potiphar comes home from his business trip, and she tells him, the, so his wife tells him the story, that Hebrew slave you brought us came to me to make sport of me, but as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, saying, This is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. Um, and I want to stop there because we're going to read some of the rest of this passage in just a minute. So, so Joseph now has found himself in his fourth prison. Not because of anything that he did, but because of the attack of the enemy on his life. Um, trying to steal this dream away from him. Um, that jail would be the place where he would spend roughly the next 13 years of his life. 13 years in that prison cell. 
But I've left out some scriptures on purpose because I want you to see what God was doing in Joseph and through Joseph through each one of these scenarios. So if you have your Bible and you're willing to read in Genesis 39, verse 3 and 4, that's the first one. I want you to see what happens here when Joseph is working for Potiphar. Anybody want to read for me? Okay. Amen. Thank you. That's uh, first, first prison, or no, this is the second prison, and look what God is doing here. He's, he, because of what? Because of his circumstances? Because of the dream? No, because of his character. Mm -hmm. uh, because he was, he was not willing to waver despite the hardship that he was facing, God was using him even in this place. He no longer had that coat of many colors. He no longer had his dad's favor. He, had, he didn't have anybody around him protecting him. He didn't have anybody speaking into his life. He was in a land he didn't belong in. But God gave him success in everything he did. And Joseph found favor in his eyes. I love this story. Because yeah. it says that it doesn't matter what prison you are living in, God can still use you, and he can still use me. So let's look at verse 5. Genesis 39, 5. Anybody else? Somebody else like to read... Uh, 39, okay, uh, Joe, John. <laughs> so it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had. Uh, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Mm -hmm. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Guys, I want you to hear this for just a second. Because of his character, yeah. because of his faith, because of his, uh, his tenacity to, to still give God everything, not only did, was God now blessing Joseph, yep. God was blessing everything in Potiphar's house. Uh, that's pretty cool, man. When God uses you and, and in the worst of your situations, but you're holding on and you're, you're staying strong in your, in your faith and your relationship with God, that hope has not left you, yep. and you're doing what God has called you to do and who he's called you to be, and then all of a sudden you begin to see the blessing of God on the people that are enslaving you, that says something about who you are as a Christian, right? It's powerful. This is what God wants from us is to say, look, I might be in a prison, and we're all going to find ourselves in prisons of our, whether it's our own doing or somebody else's doing. We all find ourselves in different kinds of prisons throughout our walk with God. But what are we going to do when we are in that place? Well, I want to go to one more passage of Scripture that tells us a little bit more about what God is doing. So Joseph, um, in chapter 39 still, uh, verses 21 through 23. So he's been thrown into jail now. He's in his fourth prison. Genesis 39, 21 through 23. Anybody? Okay. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love mm. and gave him favor and sight to keep him. Mm. Wow. 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 Come on, guys. This is God. This is what God does when we're faithful. This is what God does when you say, I don't care if I'm in a prison right now. And I can tell you about prisons all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament where God shows up and things happen because of the faithfulness, character, and obedience of the people that landed in those prisons. But I want to propose something to you this morning, that Joseph wasn't in any of those prisons. He was in training to be ready for when the time was right for God's plan to come to fruition. I believe that every part of your story, every part of my story, is a part of the story that God is writing and using to prepare us for something bigger in the next season of our lives. Yeah. I shared with you earlier how I had pastored a church. I was a youth pastor for 12 years, and I was a senior pastor for nine years. In uh, two, what, what year was it, Phil? 2019. It was 2019. 2018, I'd been pastoring for eight years, and I went into a burnout. Problem was, I didn't know I was in a burnout. She did, but I didn't listen to her. And I kept trying to keep this church afloat. And the church was dying because of me. Mm -hmm. And it took almost a year 
before I finally came to. And um, I remember stepping away that day thinking, God, all I've ever wanted to do was preach. That's all I've ever wanted to do is to serve you, to give you my life, to, 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 to be in, in a position where I can lead people to Jesus. That's what, that's what I told him. And now you stripped away, right? That's Because that's how it begins a lot of times. You, God. Yeah. You stripped it away. I can no longer do this. Well, for about a year and a half, um, we were church shopping. COVID hit, of course. And then we were church shopping on computers like everybody else. And um, uh, when we found out about the church that we're attending right now, a brand new pastor there. He had been ministering for 33 years. He's one of Jonathan's... Um, uh, contemporaries now, they, uh, they meet every couple of weeks, uh, Brian Harrell. Um, we started going to the church, church doors opened up, and I went to him and I said, here's my story. And uh, he said, well, what can I do to help you out? And that was the beginning of a turn in my life once again. The prison that I had just came out of was getting ready to close, the doors were getting closed behind me. Mm. You know, it's true about every one of us, so when we trust God, we walk through those hardships of life, those prison doors, when we feel like they're, they're slammed shut with us on the inside for a while, and then they're going to open up, and it's going to be really freeing. And I can't tell you, um, because it's one of those things that you have to live out yourself, what happens um, on the inside when you see God begin to birth new dreams and new visions and new ideas in your life again. And that leads us to the last part of this. And that is in Genesis chapter 41, verses uh, 41 through 44. And I just simply titled this. Who remembers what the dream was? Two dreams. What were they? The wheel will bow down. Eleven brothers will bow down. And then the parents and brothers will bow down, right? 22 years. 22 years. Actually, it's a little less than that. 22 years comes, but listen to what happens here. Genesis 41, 40, uh, 41. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Now let me stop there. I, I guess I didn't see that as I was putting my notes together here. Joseph had interpreted dreams for uh, uh, two people in jail. Uh, they came to pass. One of them was going to be released out of jail. The other one was going to die within a couple of days. Both things happened right away. Um, happened really quickly. Problem was, Joseph said, when you, uh, when you get to, uh, the, back to the palace, let, the, the, let, the, the, uh, let Pharaoh know that I'm in here. Uh, it never happened, so he stays in jail longer than he probably would have liked to have. And now the king is, or the Pharaoh has had a dream of his own, and he's gone to his wise men, he's gone to the magicians, he's gone to everybody that he had once confided in, try to figure out what the dreams were all about and, and they're like we have no idea and finally uh, I think it was the uh, the baker said I know a guy I know a guy he interpreted a dream while I was in jail and it came to pass that's why I'm here so Pharaoh calls for Joseph and Joseph in, uh, interprets the dream the dream was this there was going to be seven years of abundance in the crops and the land followed by seven years of famine well, Pharaoh gets it and says, I'm letting you out of jail today. And look, at this is where we're picking up. So Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge. Oh, don't listen. He's been in four prisons. Four prisons. <laughs> he gets released. And Pharaoh says, I put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. And then Pharaoh takes his signet ring, and if you ever have had a class ring uh, from graduation, it would have been something like that. It would have had a king's stamp on it. He would have melted some wax on a, on a document and put a signet ring in there, and that would have solidified whatever decision was made. He gave Joseph the power to make decisions for the whole land of Egypt, and he wasn't an Egyptian. He was a Hebrew yeah. slave. Yeah. That's the God we serve. And so uh, Pharaoh goes on to dress him in robes of fine linen, put a gold chain around his neck. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. And men shouted before him, make way. Thus he put him in charge of the whole land 
of Egypt. Not too shabby for an ex-con. <laughs> From a prisoner to a prince. That's how God works. That dream is about a future famine. So for the next seven years, Joseph is second in command. He is building stuff. He is building barns. He's preparing stuff to get ready to bring in all this harvest. They're storing it. They're saving it for the future famine. Seven years comes, and guess what happens? Everything dries up right away. Yeah. Now we're in the seven-year famine. Guess who was a part of that famine? Anybody want to guess? Who was involved in that famine? His family. Those parents and those 11 brothers, well, they no longer have food to take care of themselves. They no longer have uh, the ability to feed their animals. So what do they have to do? They got to go to Pharaoh to see if they can get favor to take care of their family. Talk about plot twists. One day, Joseph is a prisoner because of something that happens in Potiphar's house. And now, he's in charge of Potiphar. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. He is no longer this prisoner. He is now um, fulfilling the purpose and the plan that God has for him. So, in Genesis 41, 53, and 54, we see the seven years of abundance, seven years of famine. And then maybe you remember uh, this song. I twisted the words a little bit. Reunited and it hurts so good. Reunited. So seven years, we're in this famine. And Joseph's family is being impacted by what's going on. Many, many years have gone by. Joseph no longer looks like that 17-year-old young man that they threw in a cistern that many years ago. And in Genesis 42, verse 6, it says, Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces on the ground. There's the fulfillment. 22 years after the dream, God fulfills the promise. I'm going to invite the worship team to come on back up. By the way, I love you guys. Thank you for worship, man. That is, there is something to be said about just loving, loving the Lord and worship. And I, um, I know my family, we were just enjoying the presence of God there. But only God can take a 17-year-old, arrogant, punk like Joseph, give him a dream, allow him go, to go through all these different things, only to raise him up as the second in the land. To give him a dream as a teenager and allow that dream to come true as a young adult. You see, God is not only in the business of giving us something to be hopeful for, he's also in the business of redemption, mm -hmm. redeeming us, redeeming situations, redeeming stories, redeeming yeah. our past. Mm -hmm. He's in the business of taking something that once was broken and reshaping it so that it looks more and more like Jesus. Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. In turn, they end up getting his dad and mom, and the family's reunited. You know, 22 years is a long time. Bitterness could have set in. Resentment could have set in. He could have been saying, you know what, 22 years ago, you, 22 years ago, you guys threw me in a cistern, and you're about to find out what it looks like. But instead of that, Joseph says, I'm going to take care of you for the rest of this family. I'm going to set you up so you will never have to worry a day in your life about the food for your family. That's what hope does. It doesn't look at the problem. It looks at the solution. It doesn't look at the enemy. It looks at the Savior. It says, God's going to bring me through this. 
Now, I understand that every church closes the services out a little bit differently, and I, you know, I know Pat, I talked with Pastor Jonathan a little bit about this message this morning. The reality is, I've walked around a lot of Christians who were living in prisons that they didn't even realize they were in. Anger, hatred, resentment, whatever it looked like. And they would come to church every Sunday and put on the happy face, and when somebody says, how are you doing? We get the same old Christian answer, good. But inside, they're walking away, and they're broken, and they're hurting. And they've been crying out to God when God has said, I've brought people around you to come alongside you. So I'm going to close this morning with um, an altar call or a time at the altars. And I, I realize we don't have like old-fashioned traditional altars in here. Maybe for somebody it might look like just coming to the front row and taking a seat. Maybe maybe this morning you're, you're here and you're just like, you know what, man, I just want to see the Lord in the, where I'm at right now. But maybe you're here and you're like, you know what, I've been living in a prison and I'm ready to be broken out. I'm ready for this thing to end. I'm ready for God to do a new thing. Whatever that looks like for you this morning, what we're going to do is um, we're going to close with a time of worship. And if at any point during that time of worship, if you want to come forward and pray, if you want me or my family to pray with you, we'd be happy to do that. I know you guys have some folks here that are set up to pray as well if, if people want to yeah John and I but here's the here's the tragedy sometimes of coming to church is we walk out just as imprisoned as we were when we walked through the doors because we're not willing to surrender mm -hmm. we're holding on to that thing and saying well God will fix it at some point and maybe God is saying I will and I want to do it today mm -hmm. so we're going to close if you feel like coming forward, great. If not, you want to pray in your seats, that's fine. But we're gonna we're gonna worship the Lord today.